Paul made a rather extraordinary claim in the previous chapter, 6.14. He said, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Sin no longer holds any power as king, lord, ruler over you because you have no longer, you're no longer held under law, but under grace. So if I'm understanding it correctly, and I believe I do, if you are under the law, then sin grips you. Sin only loses its grip on you, not by how moral you can be, but only if you are under grace by Christ king and lordship over you. And because God's law forbids any sin, and those who are guilty of sin, who are living under the law, lead to God's judgment according to the law, leading to our death. And this tells those who know the law, he says in chapter 7, that sin's power over them makes all religions, all philosophies, and all ways of life simply law-keeping. All you are doing is, well, I'm going to make up this religion, this philosophy, this worldview away from Scripture. All you are going to do is make a law-keeping worldview. And you better live up to it perfectly. Do you remember in Acts 15 when Peter spoke before the Jerusalem council regarding whether Gentiles should be circumcised to be Christian or not? He says, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Peter calls to those who know the law. You know the law? You know it was handed down to our forefathers? They they couldn't live up to it. The Gentiles can't live up to it. And you know you can't. Why would you add the burden of the law upon our Gentile brothers? When Paul told the Philippian church in Philippians 3 that under the law he was blameless, he was referring to the way humans judge one another under their law, under the law. But a few verses later, he said he found a new joy and a new peace, not by his righteousness under the law, but the righteousness of God that is in Christ Jesus that can only be received by faith. So Paul explained to this Roman church here in Romans in chapter 6 that we Christians have died to sins in our baptism into Jesus Christ, raised to walk in a new life, freed from sin, and into a daily life of being cleansed of sin and into a worshipful life following Jesus. Here, Paul directs his attention to those who know the law. I think this includes the Jewish population, sure. But not, all, not only. There's a lot of God-fearing Greeks in this congregation. That's their background. They were taught the law. You can also refer to as well those who know Roman law. Because what he's about to say is a little bit of that. But the thou shall not covet comes to mind. He's talking about the law of God. Paul is still preaching to the whole of the Roman church. But expositing the law as an example to Christians no longer under the law but under grace. So follow with me in verses 2 through 3. It says, For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she would be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Paul is talking in general terms here. He's doing this general term of the covenant the covenant of marriage to show how we are released from the law. The focus is the law going from the law to being under grace. And he gives this as an illustration. A woman is married. This is the general sweep, but she is bound by covenant to her husband while he lives. This is true in Jewish, but also in Roman laws. Paul's words here were in this way. If she is married to a man but is joined to another man, she incurs the stigma of an adulteress. But if he dies, she is released from that bound bondage. She is released from the covenant of marriage. She is free to remarry. Again, it's a generalization that Paul is using only to say this. Christians were bound to the good law like a woman who was bound to a good man. But death frees us to be bound to grace. And this is an interesting way. And follow this as we go, go from there to verse 4, where he says, Likewise, 
my brothers. So again, he's talking to Christians. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Likewise, my brothers. See, we, we have this, uh, when we go from chapter 6, we have this mentality. What do you mean um, slave, going from slaves to sin to slaves to righteousness? I want to just be free to do whatever I want. And he says, that's not what the Savior does. He does not set you free from the bondage of sin to go and sin some more. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to you know, give you healing from blindness to leave you in the dark. He says, likewise, my brothers, you've been freed through his death. We have died to the good law through Jesus. And because of this, we belong to another. We, did, we once belonged to sin in the same way. You are freed from that, and now you belong to Jesus. You are under his lordship, his kingship. And in his, in his lordship, he has set you free. Not only from the law, but from his condemnation of you as a sinner. We have died to the law in Jesus to be raised with him, to walk in newness of life. We're not serving two masters like an adulterous woman, but have died to the first in order that we may be joined in Jesus Christ. Do you remember back in in chapter 3, Paul said no one was righteous. No one even seeks for God. No, not one. He says that's both for Jew and Gentile alike. That is also for the moral and immoral, those looking squeaky clean and those coming in quite filthy. All humanity is equally fallen, deserving death, deserving the condemnation that comes from the perfectly good and righteous and just law, the law of God. We, we cannot be in sin's power, under sin's binding, and also in Christ. We must die to ourselves, we must die to that, deny ourselves and take on Christ and live and we live indeed because of his resurrection. Look at verses 5 through 6 now. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. It didn't free us to go back to saying, well, you better work it out that you might save yourself. Before, before Jesus conquered us, the law of God aroused our sinful pleasures, just craved more joys that led to death. We said, well, that bore the fruit of death. Let's go to the next thing. And we just suck in the resources, death after death after death. So is the law of God even good then? If it takes sinners who are feasting upon death after death and bearing the fruit of death, is the law of God even good that when it comes, it arouses sinners to sin even more and condemns us? Ask people today and you're going to get a mixed, rather contradictory response. Just go out on the street, especially if someone has a Christian background, and say, what do you think about the law of God? Well, some religious laws are good. And others are not. And I get that. When you say, well, you know, I like some of the stuff that's back there, but there's also some of it that I really don't like. I don't like it when God tells me this or excludes them. So I'll take the good part of the religious code and I'll, ex- and I'll just uh, consider the rest of them utter nonsense. And so my response to this, the judgment of goodness and holiness, righteousness, justice, is in the human creature hands rather than God as creator who has revealed himself. Is that, is that the case? Do we define what is holy and good and right and just? We haven't been doing a very good job of that for all of human history. Why would we think my generation or the generation after me would fare any better? We need God to reveal holiness. And he has in his law. So the law of God is holy. 
righteous, and good. Because God is holy and righteous and good. And the reason why we hate it is because we are not holy, righteous, and good. No, not one. I think Paul is actually anticipating the Jewish as well as the God-fearing Greek Christians in Rome of accusing him of throwing, with throwing away the Old Testament and just writing it off as evil. Well, that was a terrible idea. God has finally come to us in grace instead of law. And that is terrible. It's an awful way of viewing Scripture. See, the, the problem with the law is that it reveals to sinners that we're sinners. It reveals to us who are under judgment of that law that we are judged along with the devil. And boy, that does not make me feel very good. Through the law is good, and though it is good, giving an open book containing God's law to a sinner will only convict the sinner and stir in their hearts to produce even more fruit of sin and death. See, I'll put it in this way. Your sinful heart has trained your ears to listen to only what your heart craves, which is why when the law of God is read, we turn and run. Now, the law defines righteousness to a fallen humanity who cannot free himself from the law's convic- conviction and condemnation. So the, the law was not God's means to obtain his grace. But as Paul says in Galatians 3, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Now, but that we'd be made right in God's eyes by faith in what Jesus has done and who he is. So he said, well, it wasn't through the law that we would save ourselves. It was to show the guardian that through the law, one who is coming will obey the law perfectly for humanity. He will come from us. He will be God in the flesh. Just like um, Paul, who thought of himself as blameless under the law, and this is how we like to think of ourselves, we're really good people. I'm a good person. Only discover, to discover a much higher, perfectly pure goodness or righteousness that is in God, that is simply mine by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not a good person. But Christ is the goodness of God. I mean, they follow me and continue with this with verses 7 through 8. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. Think about this with me, parents. Those of you who well, had been parents, just think, think this through with me. What we think we need to do to raise good children is to simply block any and all things that come by their way as tempting. And then that will lead them to the good and narrow path. All I have to do is to give them a scenario in through their childhood where they are never in contact with temptations. And if I find one, I'll try and remove it. Well, Paul says that the human problem isn't that we are tempted with too many things. Nor can we say it's the world's fault that my child or I am a sinner. The law does this just by saying, do not covet. So if your kid doesn't know what covet means, and you come in, you say, well, the law of God says do not covet, children. What do you expect, according to the Apostle Paul, is going on in their little hearts? Oh, I better go covet. I'm going to go learn to do more coveting. And if I feel really guilty, I'm going to try and do this by lying or covering it up. It's like saying, kids, it's time for bed. You know, and I'd like to think that a child's brain is just going around delighting in daddy's rule. Oh, praise be to God that daddy just cares for us. He wants us to get plenty of rest at our school day. Tomorrow goes well. And it's, you know, that's not what it is. It's 
Um, oh, Daddy says it's time for bed. Well, I was tired. But now that the rule is bedtime now, I think I'm going to protest. Because now all of a sudden I feel the urge to stay up all night. And I look at them and I say, well, that's, that's odd because I feel the same way. I'm given the law of God. And I'm like, oh, something in me says, I, that, we need to produce that. Praise be to God that in Christ, I'm dead to that. And now under grace, not only can I say no to the temptation, no matter how much of a, of a tsunami of the temptation is in front of me, you know, where I said, oh, I'm just going to try and eliminate all those things like a Pharisee. Now it's in front of me. I could say, no, I have found something better. I found someone better. I am under grace because of God. So just by hearing the law of God, Paul says, do not covet. Sin, he says, grips my sinful heart and produces all kinds of coveting in me. He's talking about now. It was, it was, it was ferocious before. And now the war is on. Because before, the law said, you should not covet. And I just, well, I better go ahead and covet. And I just do it freely. And now I've died to that law. I've been set free by grace. And now the war is on. Turn with me back to Exodus 20. This is, and you're, for those of you who remember uh, last year's uh, sermon series through Exodus, we went through the Ten Commandments rather quickly. And uh, one of these days, Pastor Stephen and I will go back through that a lot more uh, diligently. But in, in Exodus 20 and verse 17, the last of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, he says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Um, now, I want to go through this with me. Follow along with me as I'm going to try and meander through what he has said. It is good to desire a good wife. It is good to desire good oxen, or donkey, or a car, or whatever it is that we're thinking of. It is good to desire a good house. Yahweh is not telling Israel, you should not desire anything. This is not a Buddhist religion. He's saying, yeah, it is good. It's good to desire a good reputation, to have a good job. The desire for good things becomes bad desires when our desires rule over us with sin. Because coveting is just that. It takes a desire for a good thing and looks to our neighbor and says, I'd rather have that. In fact, I really don't think God is treating me well. I'll just go ahead and take that. Whatever sin gets me to want to get that, I'm going to get that. And I covet and I covet. I didn't before. But now you have told me, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet your neighbor's oxen or car. They're a wonderful house. They're good life. Don't go around with your friends and say, man, you know, they, they've, got it, they've got it bad because they got all those things because inside your heart is stirring. Boy, I think I would handle what they have better than they do. And I'm rather unsatisfied with what God in his sovereign good providence has provided me already. See, that desire for good things has turned into a bad thing because my corrupted sinful heart took not only the righteous commandment, but a righteous desire and spun it in corruption, and now I covet. Not just the material stuff, too. If your heart tells your mouth to hurt people, to get angry when you don't think you are being treated in the way that you should. And the, you said, oh, I hear the commandment, go the way of peace, be gentle. That's for other people, not me. And God doesn't know exactly what I have to put up with. But I see unloving people, by golly, I'm going to tell them, you're an unloving person, and, I should des and you deserve vicious, wrathful treatment from me. And see, we hear the commandment, and it gets corrupted in the heart. It says, oh, I deserve this kind of treatment, or I deserve this, and I am better than other people. And it's corrupted with this desire. It's like once you hear the law, it says, I'm going to feast upon this and bear more and more and more fruit of death. And... 
Instead of hearing the law with a heart that is new in the worship of Christ, a newness of life. And it's and it's just it's just a heart that produces more and more fruit of lawlessness rather than more and more fruit of delight in our worship of God. So, my dear sinner, the foolishness that is inside of you is far more dangerous and far more deadly than the temptation that is around you. Don't think like a Pharisee. I'm going to take the law and I'm going to earn my right before God and in good reputation before men by saying, I'm going to remove all temptations, remove everything out of my way, condemn the world by my righteousness. Paul said, that's exactly where I was. For the law, I was zealous. As for righteousness, I was blameless under the law. He says, then I found and I was encountered By a righteousness far greater than mine. The righteousness of God. That can only be received by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there is incredible beauty in God's law. Don't dispense with it. Don't say, well, the Old Testament is gone. Forget it. It's ugly. It's terrible. It is not. It's beautiful. It actually reveals God's protective care for his people. The thou shalt nots are not God just making up arbitrary rules because he just felt like being a lawgiver. They are protective. They are loving. They are jealous of a God who is perfectly holy and cannot have impurities and unholiness before him. The trouble is, we are guilty of breaking his laws and our hearts are bent on producing more sin to feed our pleasure the more law we hear. You need more than habits And more than temptation avoidance to be saved. You need to be freed. Freed from the law's condemnation. And raised with a new life. With a new heart as a new creature. That says no to temptation and yes to the law of Christ. And that is only possible if you are under grace. Follow with me again through verses 9 through 10. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. What, what good is it to visit a man on death row? He's there for murder. And you go there quoting to him the criminal law code. And you open it up and say, well, here's the number and this is where it's at. Here's all the Supreme Court decisions after that. Look at all these case laws. And I want you to know more and more of this law that you broke. And what good is that? What's good is it to tell them of the history of the criminal law? Well, let's go back to medieval England. Let's go back to common law. Let's go back to where it is and with how the Romans executed criminals. What good is that? What good is it to go before a man on criminal ro- on uh, death row for murder and say, oh, look, the, the Latin root word for homicide is homicidium, and it literally means to kill a man. You have done nothing. It's not the fact that homicide is a bad law. It's a good law. And murderers deserve to be condemned. It's just that the good law condemns the criminal. It doesn't set them free. You and I are criminals already guilty of breaking God's eternal law. Yes, God's law says, do this and you will live. The sad thing is, by covenant, what did we say? We will do this. And we did not. The very law promising life, Paul says, has proved to be the death of me. Who will do this? That is, obey God's law perfectly, that I may live. Christ's righteous life is received by sinners by faith in Christ. Who he is and what he's done. He's obeyed the Father's commands perfectly, even to the point of death on a cross. Christ obeys the perfect law of God. Do this and live. A promise received by the offspring of Abraham, Paul says in Galatians 3. We are children of the promise through Jesus Christ, not by law keeping. Both Jew and Gentile alike, both moral and immoral, any and all. The promise to Christ who does not lose even one who comes to him by faith. 
To sum it up in this way, the law may define and describe sin, but the law cannot save us from sin. So, hey, parents, once again, your children need to know God's law. They do. Read the Old Testament. Read Exodus. The law is good. The law is holy. The law is just. But you cannot expect God's law to accomplish what only God's grace in Jesus Christ can do. And it is the same not only for our children, but for you. Hear me out on this. You take a good look at yourself. You deserve God's silence toward you. You deserve God's wrath upon you. And you read God's law. But don't expect to be saved from God's wrath by knowing and doing the law the best you can. That is not Christianity. Seek the righteousness of God that is in Christ Jesus. Seek Him. You cannot live His perfect life. And you cannot die his atoning death. But good news. Christ lived and he died to save sinners. As Paul said, whom I and the chief, the foremost. He frees you from the law. And if the son of God has set you free, you are free indeed. Beloved, the mutilated Christ suffered greatly and he died. And in our baptism into Jesus, we die to sin and the law to be raised to walk a new life. But as, just as Jesus was raised from the dead, you have a new life. You have a new heart, new desires. And now the battle begins. The law says do not covet. And you begin that walk, that journey of sanctification, where your heart says, oh, I'd like to bear that fruit. And by God's grace, you're continually cutting that out and living a holy life before him. I like what Cotton Mather says here, which is why I did not reword it the way he the way he puts it is perfect. Until the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ arrives unto us, the law pronounces unto us nothing but curses. We hear nothing but a thunder of wrath cursing us. See, when I read David, he says, I delight in the law of God. I meditate on it day and night. He can only do that if he's freed from the law's condemnation. He understood grace. We understand grace in Christ Jesus for us. And this world is a kingdom of darkness. A kingdom that is under the law by Adam's sin. And under the rule of the devil. But those do not have dominion over you, church. They may go a stream that is a mighty current. But you do not have to go with them. They do not rule over you. For you are freed from the law by by your death into Jesus Christ. The gospel does not throw out the law. And that's the trend in Paul's day and now it's the trend today. This idea that love wins by God just throwing out the law. Just saying, you know what, nobody's perfect, don't worry about it. I'll just sweep it under this rug and that's not the gospel. Jesus fulfilled that law by living a righteous life in your place. That's the only way a dead sinner under the law and thus God's wrath can be justified or made right in God's eyes. How can God forgive a wicked sinner if he is holy and just and his law is eternal? How can he do so? By placing that punishment on Christ in your place. And that is only possible if Christ is fully human fully God, able to reconcile you to a holy God, but also that he lived a righteous life. You are in Christ who obeyed the law perfectly for you. Otherwise, you are still under law and sin still grips you and rules you as your king. Even now, when I read the Old Testament to you, does your heart say, hmm? Or do you say, does your heart wander around? Oh, that would really judge so-and-so if they were here. Boy, I tell you what, I imagine that's making someone else in another pew squirm. Or is that law to you to say, oh, man, that condemns me. But it draws my eyes to Christ who lived a righteous life for me and died a atoning death that I might enjoy my God forever. No, he does not throw away the law. That's the only way that we get into 
be living before God's holy eyes and being holy in his sight. It's by being in Christ that you are in Christ who obeyed that law perfectly for you. If we are no longer under law, but now under grace, what is the way to godly living to the glory of God then? Paul already answered whether if God is glorified by his grace abounding, if we just sin more and more. No, rather, God transforms us to delight and obey his law by freeing us from the law and putting us under grace in Jesus Christ. So what is this? That means that the Christian has died to the law by dying with Jesus in his death. Raised to a new life as Jesus was raised from the dead. Yet, the law is still God's living and active word. It's profitable for you. It is good. His law continues to bring to light sin that's still living in us. More and more, this is where the battle is. God roots it out. And it is impossible for the sinner who is trying to justify himself before God and his church by claiming to be a moral person saving himself to confess sin. And this is where I'd like to, this last thought is where I'd like to end us. I have learned in my life is when I'm trying to hide sin is when I refuse to confess sin. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what sin you're trying to hide before God, but it isn't working. I don't know what you're trying to do in life. You say, well, I'm just, that didn't work. I'm just going to try and whip myself into more moral shape, remove more and more temptations from my life, and that will make me holy, and it will not. I've seen this too often in people who have addictions of various kinds. Oh, if I could just hide it better in the secret. If I could just be in the dark a little bit more, then I won't be exposed before God and his holy church. So I can still go and hear a sermon perfectly fine and think that I'm right. You can only be made right because there is a higher righteousness than yours. It is the righteousness of God which is revealed in the law which condemns sinners. So if you're sitting there going, I would never confess sin. Can I just give you a little bit of a pause with that? It is good to confess sin before the church, before God. Go before God in prayer and say, Lord, I am lusting for this. There is something in my heart that craves for this. And then I hear your law and I just crave it more. Kill it. Forgive me. Give me strength to live up to your commands. I messed up again. I demanded right treatment from so and so. My wrath came against them. Lord, forgive me and give me a gentle heart. Free me from the law. Kill me in the law in Christ Jesus that I may be raised to walk in newness of life. Let me put it simply to say this and listen closely. It is dangerous to see the church as a people never to confess sins to. Or to think they're not worthy of it because they're sinners too. Well, he still commanded us to confess our sins to one another. He gives us the promise, you know, confess sins. You are forgiven. It is dangerous to your spiritual health to withhold it. I'm suspicious of Christians who never confess and confess sins. I'm suspicious of big teachers and preachers that are very famous in our culture that never confess sins. They're always right. Always on the defense. Never allows anyone to confront them in any wrongdoing. And if you do, you will face anger, defensive walls. Still trying to live up to the law to save yourself. Grace frees us in this way. God exposes sin in our lives. And we are free to confess these sins to other Christians because we're no longer under condemnation from those sins. I can freely confess my sins to you because I know it's not condemning. And I confess it to a church who knows and loves me and says, let me help you not return to that. Let me help you and encourage you in your faith in Jesus Christ that he has done all that is required of you to delight in God now and forevermore. That he obeyed the Father perfectly for you. That you are no longer under law. You are under grace. And he has paid for it all. I'd say when, when I look to this and I say, okay, Jesus paid it all. Amen. So here is my lust, church. Here are my lies, God. Here's my anger, my pride. Direct my eyes to see them. 
not only paid for by Jesus' death, but those sins would be dead to me now as well. Your escape from the law is not to do better or to try harder. You must die in Christ to be, and be born again. Become a new creature, redeemed and made clean, justified in God's holy sight. And such freedom from the law is by faith alone, in Christ alone. Praise be to God that Christ paid it all. Have you been freed from the law? Are you under grace to delight in God forever? The gospel bids you to come and die. Die to self. Die to the law in Christ's death. And receive his righteousness and life. So trust in Christ. Be baptized. Be discipled. Have you been freed from the law to follow him all the closely? To the glory of God the Father. Amen.